Hello everybody and welcome back. Here we are now in the next part of this problem. Well, we're really still going to finish up part A. So we're going to have to finish filling in some of these blanks. Then we will be able to write our estimated regression equation. So in our first video, we went through the regression statistics and the ANOVA, including the F-test. Now we're going to get into filling out this information that is needed for our estimated regression equation, intervals, hypothesis, testing, prediction, etc. Now, if you watch the videos for the first problem in this module, problem 14-1, what I did there is I started actually calculating the price coefficient. And then I used the price coefficient to obtain the intercept because of the relationship between those two. Now I don't actually have to do that because I can see I have an interval for the intercept. So I can actually use that interval to figure out what that intercept is. Because if we remember, those intervals are always the point estimate plus or minus some margin of error. Right, so this is the point estimate plus some margin of error, and this is the point estimate minus that margin of error. Very, very fam familiar, right? It's similar structure as what you saw back in module nine, module eight, when we were looking at confidence intervals for the very first time. So what I know is that this half width of an interval, which is exactly this, is perfectly equal to this half width of an interval, which is exactly that. Which means that that coefficient is exactly in the middle of that confidence interval. So if I figure out the middle of that confidence interval, 108.48, or sorry, 104.48 plus 2702, divide that by two, that gives me my coefficient 65.75. Okay, so that was a different approach to getting that result, to obtaining that coefficient, just because I started with different information. Now, the standard error. How can I get the standard error? Well, again, I can take advantage of this information that I have here in front of me. If I take, let's say, that upper limit, which I have right here. Well, now I have that in that coefficient is 65.75 plus, well, that critical value, that T, well, this is 95%. So I know that this is the T that corresponds with 0.025. And I know that that's the T that comes from a distribution with three degrees of freedom. So I can go to my tables, my T tables, and I can find, okay, here's three degrees of freedom, here's 0.025, that critical T is 3.182. 3.182. Multiplied by that standard error equals, well, this is that upper limit, right? Equals 104.48. So now I just have to rearrange this and I can solve for that standard error. So 104.48 minus 65.75 divided by 3.182, that gives me my standard error, 12.17. And now I can get my t-statistic, because that t-statistic is the coefficient divided by that standard error. So 6575 divided by 1217, and I have 5.4. There. Again, it's a very different approach because of the information that we have. Now, next row, price. Oh, price, that price coefficient. Remember that price coefficient, that formula, 
look something like this. And of course, if you watched the first video, well, you saw how time consuming, how tedious that calculation was. So you might be inclined, well, let's go back, okay, let's do this. Let's, let's go back to the data and let's calculate all of this. Well, do we have to? What information do I have here? I also know that there exists a relationship between that slope and the intercept. And I have the intercept. And I have those two means, the y bar and the x bar. I just solved for that intercept is 6575. Y bar? Well, that's easy enough to calculate it, but it's also given to us here. I have Y bar is 10, and I have X bar, 57.8. So I have 10, and I have 57.8. Well, this is a much faster way of calculating that slope coefficient. So here we go. I have 65.75 minus 10 divided by 57.8 is 0.96, but of course that's negative b, so that gives me a negative 0 0.96. Okay, good job. Now we've got our coefficient. We did it in a slightly different way because of the information that we had in front of us. Next one, standard error. Okay, standard error, we're going to have to do a few calculations. That standard error of that coefficient, remember that's the standard error of the regression, divided by the square root of this piece. Okay, so it looks like we're not going to be able to avoid calculating that. We thought we could because when we looked at that slope, we thought, oh, we can avoid all of this. Okay, we didn't avoid all of it. We still need to calculate that one piece, but it's not as time consuming as calculating that whole, that whole term. So here I'm going to have that standard error of the coefficient. S, well, we know what S is. That was given to us up here. That's that 1.5, the square root of MSE. So there's the 1.5. And now I need the square root of that nonsense. So let's come back up to our data. And so here we'll have to calculate those differences squared. And then we'll add them up. And that will give us that piece of the denominator. 63 minus 57.8 squared. So that gives me 27.04. 58 minus 57.8 squared. 0.04. 59 minus 57.8 squared. 144, 54 minus 57.8 squared, 14.44, and finally 55 minus 57.8 squared is 7.84. Now I'm just going to add those up. 1444, 144.04 0.04 and 27.04. That gives me 50.8. Good. 50.8 is what I need in my square root. So this is 1.5 divided by the square root of 50.8. And that gives me 0.21. So a little bit of calculations, a little bit of 
time, but you know, again, we've managed to take some shortcuts here, given the information that we had to work with. Our test statistic, 0.96 negative divided by 0.21, negative 4.57. Now, if you wanted to, you could go to your t tables and just check to see if you're on track. You're given a specific p-value, so I don't actually need to look up a p-value, but I have a test statistic. I know what my distribution is. This is a t-distribution still with three degrees of freedom. I can go and check just to make sure I'm on the right track. So if I go down to my t-tables and I have three degrees of freedom and my test statistic is about four and a half, if I remember correctly, 457. Well, here's 457. Here's 457 in here, and I can see that corresponds with these probabilities, 0 0.01, 0 0.005. And of course, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, my p-value that I'm given here is 0.02. It doesn't look right. Don't forget, even though this test looks exactly the same as one we've already done before, that F test, this is now a two-tailed T test. So our p-value here, given these values, would actually be 0.02 and 0.01. Now, again, here I'm only getting an approximation because I'm using the tables, but I can see I'm pretty well spot on. That p-value is 0.02 with that test statistic of 0.57. That test statistic is actually really close to that value there. So my p-value is going to be quite close to 0.02. So everything checks out. We're good. Now I can also, remember we know that relationship between that T statistic and that F, we talked about that in the previous um, problem. So if I take that T statistic, 457 and square it, I should get something really close to that F. Really close only because there's gonna be some rounding error. But here I can see 457 squared is 20.89. Whereas there's some rounding error here, so I'm not going to get it precise. But Excel would have it precise anyways. So I can see I've double-checked. Everything checks out. My test statistic is the square root of my F approximately. My p-value works. So everything checks out. We're doing just fine. Now I can get my confidence interval. So let's make a little bit of room here. And of course, we're going to be using this same formula, same relationship as we use for our, our intercept. So here I'm going to have my point estimate, 0 0.96, plus or minus that critical t, which we've already looked it up. We know it's 3.182. Just as a reminder, we can come down here, right? 3 degrees of freedom, alpha divided by 2, there's that 3.182. And our standard error that we calculated here, 0.21. So that gives me a lower limit, 0.96 negative minus 3.182 times 0.21. 
That gives me a lower limit of negative 1.63 and an upper limit plus 3.182 times 0.21, an upper limit of negative 0.29. Okay, so we've completed our table. We have everything that we need to understand the nature of the relationship. And then, as we'll see in the next video, to do some prediction. We have our predicted value is equal to 6575 minus 0.96x or if I wanted to, I could say this is my predicted quantity, 675 minus 0.96 price. Because remember, we're working with a demand curve here. So I can use Q and P instead of X and Y. Now, we did find the model to be significant, right? We've talked about the model as being significant, and we've talked about in the previous video how it's a pretty strong relationship that R squared is quite high. Price captures 88% of the variation in quantity demanded. We talked about that very strong linear association, and here I know now that it's negative. So that coefficient of correlation is negative 0.94. So not only is it a very strong relationship, but it's a, lin it's a negative relationship. So price and quantity are moving in opposite directions, which those of you who are familiar with the law of demand from your economic classes, well, that comes as no surprise. We know that marginal effect, the effect of a one unit change in price, the effect that it has on quantity. Now, let's make sure we know what our units are. So our units here are in dollars, and our quantity, well, it looks like it's just in numbers. They're, they're, it's not in tens or dozens or hundreds or thousands or millions. It's just the raw number. So a one unit change in X means a one dollar change. And this tells us the impact on quantity, right? So for each additional dollar, so I always think in additional because I, it, for me it's easier to think in positive changes. So for each additional dollar that the price increases, quantity demanded or average quantity demanded falls by 0.96. Okay, so for each additional dollar that you increase the price, quantity demanded decreases by 0.96. So that's what that point estimate means. Now for that interval, I'm 95% confident that if you increase the price by $1, the average quantity demanded is going to fall by between 1.63 and 0.29. So again, that's that interval estimate for the average predicted value. For each additional dollar that you increase the price or that we increase the price, I'm 95% confident that the average quantity demanded is going to fall, because it's negative, it's going to fall by between 1.63 and 0.29. Okay, good. I think we have everything done for part B. We'll take a break, start fresh. And I'll produce a new video for part C, where then we are going to use this estimated regression equation for prediction. Again, there's two reasons for doing regression. One is to understand the nature of that relationship. That is what we have just talked about. That is what we have just done here when we interpreted that point estimate and when we interpreted that interval estimate. We understand the relationship. The second reason for doing regression analysis, prediction. So that's what we'll do in our next video. Okay, guys, thank you all for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.